<laughs> Good afternoon, the Adams Group is pleased to have with us today, Professor Jane. He is currently an assistant professor at the School of Mining, Petroleum Engineering at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, University of Alberta, Canada. His, currently re his current research focus on the application of quantum mechanics, statistical thermodynamics, molecular modeling, and simulation to the development of water treatment materials, unconventional and low carbon energy, as well as energy storage system through inter interdisciplinary studies. The active research areas include phase behavior and flow of fluids in nanoporous media, enhanced and improved oil recovery, interfacial phenomena, carbon capture, utilization and storage, catalysis, batteries, membranes, web availability, water treatment, and etc. Professor Jen has over 100 publications between international journals and conference papers, which to date have been cited more than 2,100 times. So, once again, Professor. Welcome, Professor Jim, and feel free to start your presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Amara, for your present, uh, sorry, introductions. And uh, maybe I can first uh, start showing my screens. Um, Hello everyone. So I'm uh, my legal name is Zhe Hui Jin, but uh, I go by Charlie, which makes it easier for you guys to remember my name. And as explained, um, introduced, I'm from University of Alberta and the School of Mining and Petroleum Engineering, which is within the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And first of all, uh, thank you very much for the nice uh, pre introductions and uh, invitations to present our most recent works in terms of interfacial regulations in shale and tight fluids and the carbon sequestration from molecular perspectives. So before I, uh, uh, in the beginning, I just give out the acknowledgement. Again, I thank uh, the opportunities given by Atoms Group at the UFRJ to present our research in this uh, nice platform. And I would like to thank uh, uh, my current graduate students and the former graduate students who, ha who have undergone through the, the tough time during the COVID time. And uh, I would like to thank the former uh, visiting students and the scholars. And uh, certainly I would like to thank the, our funding agencies about our research. So here's the outline of my presentations. And uh, there are five parts. First of all, I'll go through some of the backgrounds and then talk about why, what is the shale and the tight fluids and why we want to study shale and tight fluids. And then I will introduce some of our studies and uh, I will give a brief summaries uh, in the fourth part. At the end, I will give some open discussions. So talking about uh, since industrial revolutions, uh, the human population, I mean, the global human population has increased dramatically since uh, in uh, since 1750 uh, all the way to the 2019. It's from the point 70, 79 billion people all the way up to the almost 8 billion people on this planet. And uh, and it sank, uh, and uh, in, uh, due to, after the Industrial Revolution, the global GDP has increased tremendously. And all of these things driven by the, ener uh, the stable energy from the fossil fuel. So it, as you can see that the current energy consumption in the globe has been like a, almost 30 times of what, what's on in 18th and uh, 19th centuries. But there is a dire consequence of that, that is the everyone is hearing about the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And this is the data from NASA. It shows that by 2019 in this, uh, in our atmosphere, the CO2 concentration is around the 415 or 416 ppm. And annually there are a lot of CO2 emissions into the, into the atmosphere. So there, the, then what we are facing is actually the global warming. And actually this data shows that 2019 is the second warmest year on a record, but maybe last year is even warmer year than 2019. So talking about the global warming, there is a dire consequences uh, in terms of um, uh, global warming. One thing is the, the uh, disappearance of the glaciers over the, uh, over, the, uh, over the world. And we have been facing enormous amount of extreme weather. One thing is uh, one extreme weather occurred in February in Texas is that completely knocked out the power uh, powers in Texas. So most of part of Texas is under the power outage. That has been a headline of the uh, a number of different major uh, medias. And uh, not to mention there are other like uh, extreme weather like fires in California and Australia, hurricanes in Gulf Coast and warm weather in 
here in Alberta, and the extreme heat in Siberia, and the extreme heat and the cold in South Korea. So you can see that such uh, extreme weather is occurring all over the globe. So talking about, uh, so considering such global warming, and when we look into the future energy mixes, in 2018, BP Energy Outlook concluded that in the future, the renewable energies and the natural gas would be on the rise. And the natural gas is the bridge uh, fuel for uh, uh, going forward to the, to the future. But here, I only show the data on the 2018 BP Energy Outlook. I didn't show the 2020 BP Energy Outlook. There is a reason because 2020 is anything but normal. So here, I summarized two keywords in 2020 and their implications to our future uh, energy perspective. The first one is obviously COVID-19, which is continuously affecting our life. And so that we have to stay within our, say we have to hunker down, we have to stay in our basement, for etc. So uh, by today, there are more than almost 120 million uh, cases in the worldwide and more than 2.8 million deaths in the world. So because of that, people cannot travel and the, the entire airline uh, business has been plummeted. Like IATA revenue dropped by 50% last year and the global GDP dropped by 3.5%. That's huge drop in the GDP. And uh, as a result, the oil consumption has dropped almost by 10%. So the results of all these things is that actually the CO2 emissions from the fossil fuels and industry has dropped by 7%. So some of the green activists, they are saying that's a great thing to have such a lockdowns. But we also need to understand because of such reduced human entropies, like we have to stay within our, say like in the basement, there are a huge mental toll on our daily life. And the economy is in, uh, is in a difficult situations now. So the other uh, key word I like to mention about 2020 is the emergence of the Biden administration. It's not because of, uh, it's, uh, Biden is uh, considered to be the most powerful person in the world. And uh, he has talked about a number of different things during the election campaign, but I, I would like to point out a few things he pledged in terms of energy policies. The first one is the no frack, no new fracking on the federal land. But even he is a, few, a, a little bit confused about whether it's a federal land on the or the entire land. But he also pledged that he is gonna invest in trillions of dollars into the renewable energy. Actually, yesterday he pledged $2.3 trillion investment into infrastructure, which included billions of dollars into the, the power grid, that kind of things. And there are a couple of things he has already done. That is he nixed Keystone XL pipeline, which connect the connect the Alberta all the way to the Nebraska. And he nixed the Keystone XL pipeline on the inauguration day. That means on the first day of in his office. And another thing he did is he rejoins, uh, the US rejoins the Par Paris Agreement. But about this no new fracking uh, policies, DOE actually had a fact checks on the no fracking things in terms of environmental, economic, and the security impacts. So here I only show two big, uh, two figures which I find uh, quite interesting to see. So actually in terms of electricity generation, because of the carbon footprint from electricity generation is a major part. And if you look into the history by uh, from 2005, all the way to the 2019, the, uh, the usage of the coal in the electricity generation actually dropped tremendously. And uh, the use of natural gas increased tremendously. And obviously the wind and the solar power actually increased by maybe like uh, 900, uh, 900%. But still by 2019, majority of electricity in US is still produced from natural gas. Last year is 40%. And the wind and the solar combined is only around 10.7% based on EIA data. So because of such change, is uh, using the natural gas to replace coal in terms of electricity generation. If you look at the em uh, emissions from the electricity generation in the, in the US in the past 15 years, actually they are improving the air quality using the amount of emission in the SO2 or nitrogen oxide or CO2s. So there is, the DOE concluded that there will be a number of different dire consequences of no fracking by 2050, 20, 2025. The first one is ironically, if US 
band the uh, band of frac hydraulic fracturing, the air quality actually becomes worse. That is because of for forty percent electricity, if you phase it out, then you need to imp, uh, you need to complement that with the coal because of this uh, wind and the solar. They just cannot like uh, fulfill this forty percent of gap. And uh, from economic perspective, there will be millions of jobs lost. And in terms of GDP, there are $1.1 trillion loss. And talking about this GDP, it's not only including the energy sector loss, but also includes the uh, loss, including any other sectors, because any other sector will be affected by high energy cost. Because of, say, like uh, when you want to deliver the food to your, to your table, you have to cost more money. And uh, the third consequence is that there is a huge issue in terms of energy securities. US has to be reliant on the OPEC and the Russia, which may not be a good thing. So the DOE concluded that the no new, uh, no new fracking things actually stunt the economic recovery after post-pandemic, uh, post-pandemic economic recoveries. So when we come to the global energy mix moving forward, we need to understand that first of all, the, the global warming is truly a global issue, which needs a global action. But we are living on a heterogeneous globe. For example, China is the leader in the green energy, but 60% of energy in China is produced from coal. India is an emerging country, which needs more energy in future, but 45% of energy is from the coal. And then we also need to learn the lessons from the COVID-19 vaccine securities. To be honest, this COVID thing is the pandemic. That means that this needs the global actions. But now it, each administration is taking our my people first policies and they are prioritizing the vaccines to their own people. It's not considering the delivering the vaccines to the entire, uh, entire hum, uh, human population on this globe. That would hurt the, the post pandemic recovery, to be honest. I believe that global energy perspective would share the similar things. But talking about oil and the gas, which is the fossil fuel, is it truly the pure evil? But actually, oil and the gas, they are integral con constituents in the green energy and the public health. For example, Tesla car needs some key parts produced from the oil and the gas to, to make its car is more efficient. And talking about the hydrogen, which considered to be on uh, clean energy, but the blue hydrogen actually use a natural gas of feedstock at the same time, it needs to do the carbon sequestrations. And talking about every day, we need to live with the PPE, the mask that is produced from the petrol, uh, petrochemicals and the pharmaceuticals also are produced from the petrochemicals. So moving forward, we need to accommodate growing population. We also need to ensure the prosperity in the general public. And we also need to preserve the environment. All needs the wisdom. So here I list the four things I personally think is important is that we need to live with the fossil fuels in, in, the, in the next few decades. But in the fossil fuels, we need to focus more on the shale and tight reservoir, which are the unconventional reservoirs and also the hydrate for sure. And uh, also we need to consider the enhanced oil and the gas recovery because the, as we extract more, more oil and the gas from the ground, it becomes more difficult to produce them. And if we in enhance the efficiencies, that would also reduce the energy footprints or carbon footprints. And another thing we have to do is the carbon capture and utilization and the storage. That is the must thing we have to do to meet the like a net zero uh, carbon emission by 2050. The third thing is the energy storage because we need to go with the green energy and uh, the energy storage is the cornerstone of the renewable energies. But talking about uh, this renewable energies and the free, uh, fossil fuel extraction, all these things contaminates our environment, especially the water resources. And here I would like to emphasize mention that now we are talking about renewable energy. We need more solar panels. We need more batteries. But one day in future, we need to deal with massive amount of these decommissioned batteries and the solar panels. But bear in mind that these materials contains heavy metals and the toxic chemicals, and they can contaminate our water resources. So environment, environment, uh, how to protect water resources in the environment? They are, it is also important things to do. 
So talking ab about our research group, driven by these ideas, we are focusing on some energy and environmental engineering problems, and especially on the physiochemical problems from the uh, atomistic and the molecular perspective to tackle multi-component, multi-phase, and the multi-scale problems. Here it lists our, uh, like our six uh, now currently actively going research activities. And uh, some of them are uh, mainly about the energies, and some of them are actually about the energy and the environment. So today, because of time limit, I only talk about the gas liquid phase behavior and the flowing nanoporous media, and talk about the CO2 storages in the underground. So talking about shale and the tight reservoirs, it provides the uh, valuable energy resources, and also it can store the carbons. So talking about US, here is the picture to show the US shale gas place, uh, shale place, I should say. And because of shale boom, US has uh, US just became the number one natural gas producing country and also the number one oil producing country. But talking about US natural gas, 70% of natural gas is from the shale, shale place and more than 60% of oil is from the shale. And so because of that, by 20, uh, since 2017, US is a net natural gas exporting country. But these uh, shale gas plays are ideal sites for the carbon storage. So you can compare these two pictures. You can see that the shale plays overlaps with the CO2 storage sites. So in other words, shale and the tight reservoir, they are uh, either uh, they can uh, produce valuable energy resource and also store the carbons. So it is, uh, has a, a feature of the Q2 birds with one stone, that kind of ideas. But talking about the shale, it is considered to be unconventional reservoirs. It has a rock heterogeneities, which consists of organic and inorganic material. Organic material is mainly the chalogen. So if you look at this SEM uh, image, the gray area here is the organic matter. And the, the bright area here is the inorganic matters. But here, inorganic matter includes all kinds of different uh, rocks, like clay, silica, and the carbonates. But talking about shale, it has a widely different pore size distributions. And some of the pores is less than one nanometers. But uh, this picture did not show the pores less than one nanometer. The reason why is that they get this pore size distribution from the nitrogen absorption, which can only detect up to two nanometer pores. But there is certainly pores down to the sub one nanometer to the up to the a few micrometers. And the shale and the type fluids is a multi-component multi-phase fluids which is include geofluids, oil, gas, brine, and some other chemicals. And uh, another one I like to mention is that the tree highs, pressure is high, temperature is high, and the salinity can be 10 times of typical seawater. So these are the features of the shale reservoirs. So when we talk about geofluids in the shale nanopores, we need to uh, consider their surface absorption. So as you can see that there is a CO2 absorption on the elite surfaces, and obviously the density distributions are inhomogeneous. So in this small scales, we need to consider the interactions from the molecular, uh, uh, molecular levels, and also the surface chemistry, what type of rocks you have would play an important role. For example, here in the CO2 dissolution in water in colonized nanopores, you can see that depending on different basal space of the colony, the water uh, distributions are different so that uh, it will impact the CO2 distributions. So here, uh, uh, so in general, the geofluids and shale nanopores, I call it unorthodox, but that is from the perspective from typical petroleum engineering or the geophysics ideas because of the current status is that the shale reservoirs are mainly explored by this petroleum and geophysics perspective. But uh, from the energy, uh, energy sources perspective, uh, in the past years, we have done some of the CO2 enhanced and the gas recoveries. We studied the uh, rock heterogeneity effect, and we also considered the effect of corn and water. And in terms of carbon storage, we mainly study CO2 dissolution in different shale nanopores. We considered the surface chemistry fact. And I like to mention that all these things is right in the toolbox of the chemical engineers. So as a chemical engineer, we can certainly do a lot of things in the study of the shale and the tight fluids. So in terms of our studies, the first one I would like to introduce is the recovery mechanisms of hydrocarbon mixtures in CO2 half and puff in organic, in inorganic and organic nanopores, which is published in Chemical Engineering Journal in last year. 
So talking about CO2 half and puff, maybe you guys are not quite familiar with this, but this is very, uh, very much widely used in the petroleum engineering is that first of all, in the reservoir, we reduce the pressure to produce the fluid, but if the pressure is the reservoir pressure is too low, we need to uh, implement uh, the complete uh, actually increase the energy. So we inject a certain gas like a CO2. But CO2 has a certain uh, as a feature that it can have a competitive absorption with the hydrocarbon uh, mixtures, so that by doing the CO2 half and puff, it can have a competitive absorption, but also it can drive up the reservoir pressure up to say 28.7 MPa from 15 MPa by doing so, and then further drop the pressures. And in this work, we use a GCMC simulation to study the hydrocarbon mixtures consisting of C1, C2, C3, and the CO2 mixtures. So it's a, like four component mixture cases, but we fix the C1, C2, C3 mole fraction in bulk as, a, as fixed, and the, during the, the half and half process, we ensure that CO2 in bulk mole fraction reaches 50 more uh, percentage of half and the soak. And we consider two different pore sizes, the two nanometer and five nanometer, both are represented micro pores and the meso pores. And here uh, for organic nanopores, we use the simplify the system as a carbon nanopores, which is 10 for three potentials to describe it. So as you can see that initially, suppose if the reservoir pressure is 50 MPa, if we drop the pressure, you can see that on the surfaces, talking about mass of pores, we will see more of the, this purple, which is the C3, which is the heavy component. And if we do the CO2 injection and do the soakings, then you can see there are, uh, there are uh, some of the CO2 are dominant on the surface. And if we further drop the pressures, you can see that the fluids in the bulk will be uh, reduced. So if we look into the density profiles, I would first mainly talk about organic mesopores about the C1 and the C3. So talking about C1, when you drop the pressures, uh, the C1 in the, in the bulk would reduce and on the surface is also reduced. And if during the CO2 uh, half and a soak process, on the surface reduced, but uh, in the middle pore it didn't, does not reduce. But if you look at the C3, during the first pressure drop down process, Actually, C3 is reabsorbed on the surface. That is because of competitive absorption between C1, C2, C3, and the C3 is the heaviest component. But in the middle of the pore, C3 is reduced. But if we talk about the micro pores, we can see that C3 is mainly reabsorbed back into the this uh, small nano, a uh, small micro pores. In other words, if we want to produce, uh, say, if we want to, if we do the pressure dropping. We are not producing C3 in this uh, in this nanopores. Actually, we're losing C3 to this to the nanopores. But if we do the CO2 uh, injection and the doing the soaking, then you can see that from the, the this red one all the way drop to the blue one. So that means that CO2 can effectively displace C3 from the surfaces. So that is the case for the org organic one. For the inorganic one, we use the e-light to simulate. So in this case you can see that, uh, first of all, when we drop the pressures, and then you can see that the C1, C2, C3 absorption on the surface may, is not that significant. But if we do the CO2 uh, injection and do the soaking, there are very strong CO2 absorption layer on the surface. So that is because e light have a partial charge on the surface. But if we look at the density profiles, again, focusing on the C1 first, then <clears throat> during the first fret pressure drop in the inorganic pores, both the, uh, the bulk fluid, uh, uh, sorry, reduced and on the surface reduced, and uh, but during the CO2 injection, and the, mainly the C1 on the surface is greatly reduced. But if we look at the C3, when we first drop the pressures, we only uh, 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 we only produce the C3 in the middle pores. We are not producing C3 absorb on the surfaces, but during the CO2 injection, we can effectively uh, produce C3 on the surfaces. That is what we have found in this work. So if we look into the recovery ratios, these two data is something I would like to emphasize is that because of competitive absorption, if we simply drop the pressures, we will lose C3 back into the organic micropores. And in terms of CO2 injection efficiency, it is effective to reproduce uh, the heaviest component. That is what we found in this work. 
And the second work I would like to introduce is the role of the brine in gas absorption and the dissolution in Calgon nanoports for enhanced gas recovery and the CO2 sequestration. This is also published in the Chemical Engineering Journal in last year. And uh, here in this work, we use the atomic um, carriage nanopores considering this uh, chemical heterogeneities. And we are considering the situation with a partially saturated brine case and the two nanometer pore, which is a my typical micropores and the typical reservoir temperatures. And for the brine, we use the sodium chloride solutions. And to keep in mind, this is a partially saturated with brine. And for the gas, we consider the C1 and the CO2. Again, we use the GCMC simulations. So here are the molecular configurations we observed at the 40 MPA case, which is a typical reservoir pressures. And the, the, this side, it shows when <coughs> there is a water, but it's a pure, there is no salts. And this part, it has the uh, salt concentrations up to six mole per liter. That is a, can be a, a typical salt concentration we see the, in the subsurface reservoirs. So as you can see that if you compare the C1 and the CO2, one noticeable uh, uh, difference is that for the CO2, there is a absorption layer on the surfaces in the in this water phase. So that means that CO2 can have a co-absorption with the water. But for the C1, you don't see that. And also you see that some of the CO2 is dissolved into the water. But if you have a like high salt concentration, so dissolution is diminished basically. So this is what we observe from the snapshots. And here are the two, di two dimensional contour plots, which clearly shows that for the C1, the C1 close option with the water on the surface is negligible, but for the CO2, this is significant. And as salt concentration increases as you goes down, the amount of CO2 on the surface actually decreases. And that actually has some implication in terms of wettability alterations, which we are doing uh, such understand uh, this uh, investigation in a separate work. Yep. So in terms of dense distributions, we analyze, we determine that there are three different zones. Zone one is there is no uh, brine, and the zone two is the gas co-absorbed with the water on the surface, and the zone three is gas dissolved into the water. So if you look at to uh, look at their density distribution, first of all, look at the C1 distributions in the zone one. It has a layering structure because it t this is two nanometer pores. In the zone two, it has some of the co-absorption, but Look, you can see that this magnitude is at least one order of magnitude smaller than this absorption layer. So we conclude that for the C1, zone one absorption is dominant mechanism, zone two and zone three, they are negligible. But if we look at the CO2 case in the zone two, that is different. Now the CO2 co-absorption can be comparable to the CO2 bulk densities in the, in the zone one. And at least it's comparable. And uh, if you have more water, it's uh, like more saturated by water, their contribution would be a bigger one. So in this case, we conclude that for the C1, zone so one absorption is a major contribution, zone two is comparable, and zone three, which uh, means the CO2 dissolution in the, in the water or brine, they are negligible. So we also uh, studied the implications in terms of CO2 enhanced gas recovery and the sequestration perspective. And similar to the previous one, we did this, uh, the first drop the pressure and the inject of the CO2. And then we just did the soak. We didn't release the pressure because if we reduce pressure, we are going to uh, lose the sequestrated CO2 back. So uh, here, uh, this data is a bit hard to understand, but to summarize, that um, we found that the salinity has an important impact in terms of the CO2 dissolution. And the contribution of the CO2 dissolution to the CO2 sequestration can drop by 33% from zero mole per liter to the six mole per liter that is comparing these gray areas. And uh, we conclude that the role of the brine would, play, would be more significant at higher water content because under the reservoirs, actually calogen can be a weekly water wet, so it can bear some of the coordinate water. And uh, if depend if you have a high water content, we believe that the role of the brine will be more significant. And the third part I would like to introduce is talking about CO2 solubility in brine water in shale nanopores in relation to the carbon CO2 sequestration. So this is about the carbon sequestration ones. And I will talk about two works we have published in Chemical Engineering Journal this year and another one published in the Langmuir. So talking about CO2 st uh, carbon storage, oh sorry, CO2 storage in shale formations. 
And I believe that Professor Martin Trostler is the expert in this uh, the four different trapping mechanisms. And he, uh, the, there are four different trapping mechanisms in the underground saline aquifers. The first two is the structural and the residual trapping. They are mainly depend on the wettability, or I should say that it depends on the contact angle. And uh, the, the third me trapping mechanism is dissolution, which is dependent on the solubility. And the fourth uh, mechanism, mineral trapping, which is dependent on the local concentration of the CO2 in the, in the brines. But talking about where are these uh, waters coming from, there are three different uh, major uh, sources. First of all, it's called a chronic water. Water is already there. And uh, in the shale formations, because of hydraulic fracturing, we are injecting enormous amount of water into the underground. So hydraulic fracturing can also uh, inject a certain amount of water to the shale formations. And the, during the production, water flooding is a, one of the main methods we use in petroleum engineering. So injecting water also contribute to the water amount. So in terms of wettability issues, we are doing some separate investigations still under, uh, under the work. So I only showed this a snapshot to show that in the structure and the residual trapping, the wettability important, how to measure the contact angle is important. In this case, CO2 water, calogen interaction would be important case for the venue, the venue substrate is a calogen. Uh, but talking about the solubilities, it is dependent on what type of rocks you have, what type of the rock the uh, surface chemistry you have, which would determine the local interface water structures, and that will impact the CO2 uh, dissolution mechanisms. So there are other different impacts like solution pH, which will change the surface chemistry. And at the, uh, at the end, so the solubility is related to the, uh, the solvation structures, which is also the hydration structures. So talking about gas solubility and solvent in nanopore, actually it has been studied uh, like enormously, uh, very largely in the past uh, literatures. So here I only list one literature is studied by Professor Zhao from ECUSD and also the Professor Gubbins from uh, not, uh, NCSU in, in, in 2020. So in this study, they, uh, in this paper, they studied the argon solubility in carbon tetrachloride in different nanopores. So as you can see that the surface chemistry or the surface type plays an important role in terms of the solubility. And also the, based on their density profile in the carbon nanopore, you can see that the on the surfaces in the interface solvent structure is important to the solubility phenomena. So to conclude that, in terms of the CO2 solubility in water in uh, shale nanopores, we conclude the surface chemistry is important, whether you have inorganic or the inorganic one, they are important issues. And also, as I mentioned in the previous slides, the interface solvent structures and the solvation structures, they are important. But we figure that in common practice that, I'm sorry that my son is just interrupting me. Um, they are largely overlooked uh, in the past uh, literatures, but actually they play a very, very important role. And another one is I would like to mention is the salt effect and the pH under the in situ conditions. So here we conducted two, uh, actually uh, three works, but I, because of time limit, I only introduced two works. The first one is about CO2 solubility in brine in silicon nanopores. Here we use the sodium chloride solutions to represent the brine. In this work, we consider the pH effect and uh, as I mentioned that uh, depending on different pH, your silica surface might have a different surface chemistry. For example, <clears throat> this the figure shows that uh, the, the locations of the hydroxyl groups on the silica surface and the blue dot represents fully protonated hydroxyl group. But the, the green dot represents the deprotonated hydroxyl group, which means that it carries negative charge. And depending on the different pH, there are more deprotonated, um, uh, deprotonated hydroxyl groups. So it becomes surface becomes more a negative charge when the pH is high. And uh, here we constructed such system, which consists of the CO2 uh, gas phase reservoirs and the uh, outside bulk aquifer reservoirs, and which is connected to the silica. So in other words, CO2 in the gas phase can diffuse into the uh, outside bulk aquifer reservoirs and dissolve into that and then further diffuse into the uh, silica nanopores. And we study the CO2 solubility in brine in the silica nanopores and uh, under the in situ conditions. 
So here are some of the density profiles I would like to show is that uh, this is the case that we consider sodium, uh, sorry, the salinity at the 7 weight percent, around 7 weight percent. They are not exactly the same, but uh, they are representing this uh, uh, NLCL salinity in the outside of bulk aquifer reservoirs and not inside because inside they would be different. But um, to summarize, depending on different pH or different surface chemistry, if there is no uh, deprotonation going on, you can see that there are some of the CO2 absorption on the surface. But once there is a deprotonation going on, surface carries a negative charge, the sodium is attracted to the surface. And as a result, I mean, as a result, the CO2 we observe is the absorption is decreased, decreased actually. So why this happens? Then we look into the two dimensional density contour plots. The left hand side is the deprotonation degree zero, which means that it's a low pH case. The right hand side is the deprotonation degree 16.7%, which carries the surface carries a negative charge, is the high pH conditions. And here I only show that this represents the CO2 distributions, and this represents the sodium chloride distribution. It's obviously when the surface has deprotonated hydroxyl groups, sodium is uh, surrounded, actually accumulate around these deprotonated hydroxyl groups. And as a result, you can see that in general, the CO2 concentration, if you compare these two, and they decreased because you can see that this part is more lighter in terms of colors, because I, we use the same colors to represent their intensities. But think of, in the beginning, we saw that, oh, because of there are more uh, sodium is absorbed on the surface. But we are thinking, oh, actually, there might be only one or one sodium is attracted to that. But why can greatly reduce the CO2 absorption? Because if you look at these uh, ground, uh, green dots, they are generally quite white. But around uh, in the initial figure, they are not that white. And then we look into the local water structure, which is interface solvent structures, when we found the clue. So in the deprotonation degree 16.7% case, actually there are majority of the hydroxyl group is not deprotonated. And then around these hydroxyl groups oxygen, we see that actually the sodium is depleted and there's no very strong uh, absorption of sodium. And uh, so this is the local uh, water structures around this hydroxy oxygen of the hydroxy group, which is not deprotonated. But once it is deprotonated, you can see that sodium is enriched because the surface carries negative charge. So they want to go there to screen off this negative charge, which is easily understood, understandable. But if you pay attention to the water distribution, you can see that water absorption is greatly enhanced around these hydroxy groups, which is deprotonated. Our understanding is that because now you have a lot of sodium ions close to the surface, you also need a lot of more water to be close to this functional group to hydrate them so that there are more water on the surfaces around this uh, like a deprotonated oxygen uh, hydroxyl group. And as a result, the CO2 absorption around these uh, deprotonated uh, hydroxyl groups is greatly reduced. Here we have some of the snapshot to show it. So you can see that in some cases, if there is some of them, uh, hydroxy, the proton and hydroxy group, they are very close, it can happen in some cases, then you can see that there are local accumulation of the sodium to, uh, uh, to neutralize this uh, negative surface charge. And as a result, there are more water around these um, deprotonated hydroxyl groups. So this one clearly shows that the surface chemistry or the pH plays a very important role in terms of the CO2 dissolution in brine in silicon nanopores. Then we look into the overall CO2 solubility amount. And as you can see that as expected, as the deprotonation degree increases or the pH increases, the uh, CO2 uh, dissolution in brine in silicon nanopores is actually decreases. And uh, uh, but when the say the deprotonation degree is zero percent, which means it's an, uh, the pH is pretty low, then you can see that the CO2 solubility in brine is is higher is than the in the bulk case, which means it's over solubility. And uh, to mention that once CO2 is dissolved into the brine, actually it will lower 
the pH to the degree of the TH of the five, but I'm not so sure about that uh, the reservoir condition because it's high pressure, high temperature condition. Um, maybe there are certainly more studies we need to conduct uh, to understand this uh, process. But we also study CO2 solubility in water in calhydrin nanopores. And you might think calhydrin is considered to be hydrophobic. But in fact, actually, the calhydrin contains a number of different surface functional groups so that uh, the I think uh, this uh, hole used to be the postdoc of the or the PhD student of the Professor Alberto Striolo. I, I think this nanoscale work may be conducted with the Professor uh, Striolo. Maybe my memory is wrong. But anyways, it shows that the calder nanopores can be weakly uh, water wet. So in this study, we studied the CO2 solubility in water in calder nanopores. We studied the calder maturity fact. Calder has different types. And we also study the surface roughness because now the caldron surface is not like crystal-like structure. It has a certain surface roughness. And uh, we actually build a very similar system than the last case. And here is the two-dimensional density contour plots in the two nanometer pores. And what I, uh, here, these uh, dots shows the, the functional groups, uh, positions, which is the surface functional group. And that if you look at the water distribution, you can see that water are mainly around this functional group because of the hydrogen bonding effect. And um, CO2 is mainly depleted from that around them. But there is some of the extreme cases we noticed that look at here, even though there is an oxygen uh, functional group, CO2 is depleted, uh, sorry, CO2 is actually enhanced. There is an accumulation of CO2 around here and water is depleted. Then we look into the surface roughness and then actually this oxygen site is in a concave site. That means that uh, when your surface functional group is in the concave site, because of surrounding this surface functional group, there are still a lot of carbons. And because of that, this geometry may not be favorable for the accumulation of water because of surrounding there are a lot of carbons. But in the convex positions like here, they are mainly in the convex positions. Water can be strongly accumulating there, and the CO2 absorption is greatly reduced. So these are two are conclusion we get from these uh, two-dimensional density contour plots. And we also study the pore size effect. When the pore size is small, uh, like a one nanometer, even though initially the calhydrin is mainly saturated with water, the CO2 can displace the water entirely through the diffusion process. So if you look at the surface CO2 accumulation, it's completely dominated by CO2. And in this case, it's the CO2 storage mechanism is the pure absorption. But uh, in the two nanometer and the four nanometer case, water is in the middle of the pores and the CO2 mainly accumulates on the surfaces. And if you look at the surface distributions, then you can see that the CO2 can form certain cluster, they get together and they might form some of the nano bubbles on the surfaces. And this is something we observed uh, from our uh, simulation studies. And uh, to conclude, uh, in this work, we found that CO2 storage mechanisms and the capacity can be dependent on the pore size. So for example, in one nanometer pore, it's mainly dominated by the absorption. And as a result, the, the amount of CO2 is higher than the CO2 bulk densities. But in the larger pores, it's mainly through the dissolution in the middle pores and the CO2 accumulation near the calcium surfaces. And actually, the dissolution amount is higher than the bulk solubility, which is at least 2.7 times. And the CO2 storage capacity decreases with the pore size. And the, mainly the, uh, the, the most immature calhydrin has the smallest CO2 storage capacities. So to summarize, uh, we find, uh, we conclude that interfacial regulations are at the heart of the energy source exploration, exploitations, and the carbon storage in the shale and tight formations. And the intermolecular interactions and individual molecular structures are imperative to such uh, interfacial regulations. And interfacial solvent structures are crucial as formation water is omnipresent in shale tight formations, but their roles are often ignored in current studies. And so physiochemical processes from atomistic and molecular perspective would play a crucial role down the road. So here are some of the open discussion I would like to have. And uh, I think currently what we see, what we see or what we know is just a tip of the iceberg.
but I like to say that is only the partial tip of the iceberg. We are only seeing this side. We are not seeing the other side. That is because of shell and type formations are multidisciplines that it needs a lot of different disciplines. Not to mention that we are not seeing the trunk of this iceberg. So talking about challenges in the shell and type reservoirs, that is stems from quintuple heterogeneity. Number one, pore size heterogeneity, that is a multi-scale problem. Rock heterogeneity, different rocks. Number three, fluid component heterogeneity that's constituted the multi-component case. And number four, fluid distribution in homogeneities, heterogeneities. And number five, fluid phase heterogeneity. There would be multi-phase phenomena. And it is also the multi-physics process, not only the absorption and dissolution, it also includes absorption, diffusion, transport, and the interfacial phenomena. All these disciplines need to be integrated into the study of shear and tight reservoirs. So I, I summarize some of the tasks for us as a, a statistical mechanics and the working on the molecular simulations. Number one thing is that I feel like we desperately need reliable false field, which can reproduce experimental data and the characterization, especially at high pressure and high temperature cases. And we also need the, this phosphate, which is applicable to the various rocks, clay, silica, carbonates, and the different fluids, basically. And uh, unfortunately, the current phosphate we use, we say, for example, for the clay, we use a clay FF, but that is developed for the water structures on the clay surface. It is not developed for the gas absorption in clay but uh, we are somehow using uh, simple assumptions to keep using this fossil to provide some of the fundamental understandings. Another one I'd like to mention is the importance of the accurate characterization of PSD and the surface areas. And actually uh, last month, Professor Santiso and the Professor Kis uh, Kiskavins from NCSU along with uh, his um, uh, former PhD student, Dr. Shi, currently working with uh, Randy Snare at the Northwestern, actually had a one book chapter reviewing the PSD and the surface area apparatus. And uh, this is uh, this book chapter happens is a coincidence with our current invited review paper on, in the energy and the field. We are conducting a review work discussing how we should treat the PSD and the SSA de uh, determination in the shield studies. Our conclusion is that in the shield studies, because of rock heterogeneities, we have inorganic one, and uh, which includes the different rocks. And we also need to consider there are different pore geometry issues. So uh, accurate estimation or understanding about the PSD and the SSA is urgently needed in the shale and tight reservoir studies. And at the end of at the end, I would like to emphasize that this is a multidisciplinary studies, which needs the chemical engineers, petroleum engineers, geophysicists, and more to tackle the challenges in the shale and tight reservoir studies. So at the end, I would like to thank the Atoms group at the UFRG again, obrigado. I found this is a Portuguese and also Professor Tavares. I have known Professor Tavares for years, but this is the first time I think uh, giving uh, like a lengthy presentations. And I also um, thank the, this, uh, I personally think this webinar series is a truly uh, great idea, which is uh, invites the globally renowned people, uh, experts in the field. It already features some of my former colleagues. It's really nice to see them again, like uh, my former supervisor, Professor Fiza Baldi, and my former colleague, Professor Sismondi. And uh, here I would like to thank the Professor Shaw, who actually let me know that there is a nice series conducted by Fred. And he mentioned that one day I should participate, but you know what, in the beginning, I, my first thought is, really, I, can I? Then all of a sudden I'm giving uh, this presentation is close to the end. And uh, here I also like to mention that this series features so many global renowned expert, including, but not limited to Professor Chapman, Professor Gubbins, Professor Striolo, Professor Trussler. All of them I have looked up to since my PhD studies. All of them I looked up to them to get the research ideas. So it is a really a rewarding experience for me to present my study. It just feels like a, a, young, a young baseball player sharing the same fields with the star players who he has looked up to for years and all of a sudden these dreams come true. So thank you everyone uh, for listening to my presentation and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you, Professor Jin, for this amazing presentation. We are now open for questions. If you want to ask one, please feel free to enable your microphone or write it down in the chat so we can read it. Our YouTube viewers can also ask questions, for, of course. I think you can go first, Hao. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great talk. Um, I have two questions. Uh, what kind of force fields How? Do, How? Please. Do you use? Can, can you open your uh, camera? Uh, sorry, I uh, where I uh, in my desk uh, computer uh, right ah. now I don't have a a video. Uh, sorry. Oh, no problem. No problem. No problem. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, next time I I try to to have a camera. Um, the question is um, about the force field. What kind of force field did you use? For world. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much for the, this question. And actually this question is a very important question to us. So depending on different works, I think we are using different combinations. And actually I have some of the backup slides to show you. And in each work, we tried our best to uh, say validate our false field. But most mm -hmm. of times we'll find that there are limited experimental data available, especially in the high pressure, high temperature condition. So here, is one example we show that this is the case for the CO2 and the water conditions. And uh, we use, the, obviously in this work, we use the water for SPCE and the CO2 is EPM2. But I think uh, my graduate student, uh, uh, Wenhui is actually using a certain optimized uh, way to do it. And the way every time we try our best to compare with available experimental data, for example, like densities and interfacial tensions, and uh, the solubility data in bulk to validate our force field. So, but uh, yeah, I appreciate this question. Force field is a crucial one, but um, depending on different systems, we will choose the best force field combination for us uh, to use. Well, thank you. The other question is, um, when do you use uh, the proton in water? How do uh, you know that this water that is uh, a kind of uh, the behavior of the water is like uh, the protonated water. Oh. Okay, yeah, thank you very much uh, for your questions. I think uh, what you are talking about, maybe let me go back. Is it about the silica nanopore case? Is it the, this case? Yes. Okay, so here I think we use the SPCE water and um, for the deprotonation, we get this deprotonation degree based on the experimental data. And the way uh, arbitrarily graph this uh, hydroxy group on the surface, I will arbitrarily choose these uh, deprotonation ones. And uh, talking about the, uh, to be honest, we are not the expert working on the force field, but we we'll try our best to use the best force field available and to provide some important insights into the engineering and the scientific perspective. So for your questions, um, we haven't analyzed that. And I'm not sure even there are some of experimental data of available for the silica nanopores down to the two nanometers, which is very finely uh, determined, or I mean, very, very finely defined silica nanopores itself may be difficult from experimental perspective. Yeah, because uh, the I think the in the water force field uh, there is enough and good force fields of water, but the water with different pH I think is uh, the next step no for water development for fields. Yeah, thank you very much for your comments. Then I just read it down, and this is also very helpful to us, so we can look into that direction in future. At this moment, we didn't consider that, to be honest. Thank you for all. Yeah, thank you very much for your questions. I think Professor Haja has a question. Do you want to ask, Professor? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Jim, Please. for an interesting talk on shale. Here in Brazil, we are giving up on shale. <laughs> I don't know. Haja. 
Raja, can I ask you to open our camera? Uh, I think I have opened my camera, no? 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 I think it's open, but we can't it's see open, you, Professor. I think it's open. Okay, so go on. Okay. Uh, there were initial attempts to exploring shale in Brazil. It has given up mostly now. So we were interested in that time, 10 years ago, five years ago, things like that. Anyway, so some general question and introduction I want to ask you is first is uh, how to prolong the life of a well, shale, this type of production well, is a very short time for uh, organized company to prolong, say, production is six months, three months. So you have, you have to keep on drilling, it looks like, right? Yeah, is thank you. Yeah, thank prolonging the life of a... Yeah, thank you very much for your, your question. There's a, I would say that is a million dollars question. And to be honest, um, this is, but this is a daunting situations too, because of, uh, as you mentioned that um, any shale wells in the beginning, the production is very high, but over like six months or maybe one year, it just plummets. So there are different ways to do is uh, it, you, uh, you need to combine different approaches like a silt half and puff can be one of the approach and uh, sometimes people inject um, like a surfactant, and uh, but uh, the surfactant, uh, sorry, so, uh, but because of the tight reservoirs, the permeability is so small. So directly injecting the surfactant may not be working. So now people are using the CO2 flood, foam flooding method, which also involves the surfactants. And another one I, I can think about is uh, they are injecting some of the uh, like a, uh, smart materials like uh, they, it can uh, some of the smart surfactants or the polymers <laughs> they can form uh, certain gels to block some of the high permeability channels so that avoid the gas channeling things. So to answer that question, there are different approaches targeting different issues, and sometimes. Uh, a certain wall may face different problems, even though uh, there are nearby wall close by. But that is, um, each wall has a different situations, and uh, each wall you drill down, the rock properties will be can be quite different. So uh, to answer that question again, it is a combined approach, and depending on um, uh, depending on uh, uh, different uh, the wall conditions and the actual conditions we need to consider. But it, it is a big issue about the shale gas, uh, shale well, or the tight wells. Uh, the other is also a general question I would like to, for you to clarify. How can it compete in costs, let's say, offshore oil, even the South America, asking, the cost of production seems to be very high in the case of shale oil. Has it come down? Can it be competitive without any subsidies? Yeah, thank you uh, very much for your questions. And uh, to be honest, I'm not the experts in terms of the ec economic side, So, but I will try my best to answer your question. Yes, yeah, certainly uh, uh, governments are providing some of the subsidies and uh, like the US, is doing the, uh, US is doing that. And actually China is doing that too. And because of that is driven by in China, uh, China, uh, I didn't mention today, but uh, China has a uh, relies on foreign oil and gas very much so that uh, China is very much eager to produce their own uh, shale gas and uh, oil. But talking about the cost of the offshore oil, uh, so I'm sorry that I cannot comment on that. But as far as I know, uh, as the technology advances and uh, the master say in terms of the EOR or enhanced gas recovery master improved then the cost is actually coming down. And, uh, but um, yeah, it's true that the, this production should rely on the government subsidies. But here I'd like to mention is that because energy is such important thing and having the energy security is um, maybe one uh, one of top tasks any government wanted to have. So I think um, uh, there is a strong drive for certain administrations or the governments to keep producing the shale and the tight, uh, tight gas uh, productions. Yeah. And the last question is, uh... 
you are from Canada. How do you, Shale can compete with tar sands, for example. And say in North Dakota, for example, they are flaring up all this methane. Does it not cause very much more air pollution than, say, natural gas they can produce? Uh, excuse me. So your question is that in Canada, there, there are, are two things. questions, different questions. One is uh -huh. tar sands mm -hmm. producing hydrocarbon from tar sands in Canada yep. is a mm -hmm. popular thing. Can it compete or it is better than shale or there are two different things? You are in the middle of tar sands. That's why you're like <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is also a very good question. I, but I would like to mention that the production master of the oil sands and the shale, they are different. As you mentioned that the shale, its production will decrease tremendously within the first one or two years. But differently, like uh, oil sand reservoirs, once you have this kind of like these things done, you can produce continuously longer than that. So there are certain pros and cons. And certainly uh, Canadian oil sands is heavy and so that it can be have more carbon footprint. That's a certainly is, uh, an issue. But um, I think it also depends on the economically driven, economic need. For example, the most of the tar sands produced in Alberta is actually consumed within US. And that is because of US have a certain refinery. They can only take care of the heavy oil. They cannot take care of the sweet oils. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, this is um, um, depending on the need, I should say. But certainly Canada has an enormous amount of shale gas too, but uh, the development maybe is not up to the toll with the US though. And the last thing is about the environment. Say like North Dakota, they are flaring all those gases which comes from this volatile oil fields. Do you think this methane will cause more pollution than the, what you can say by natural gas? Does it cause a lot of pollution itself or is it controlled now? Uh, I think, uh, thank you very much for your question. I think this is a very nice question. And I also have been thinking about this, uh, thinking that whether natural gas is helping us or hurting us. Comparing to the coal, when we burn the natural gas, then it is actually helping us because it produces a few amount of the CO2. But the methane is more notorious greenhouse gas, like 30 times of that CO2. So obviously this environmental issue from the methane leakage is a huge issue in Canada too. And the people are, the government are trying to take care of that. And I think uh, it also costs quite a bit of money. So, um, uh, so again, I'm just uh, using the molecular simulation, try to provide a fundamental understanding. So, uh, uh, I'm not the, the person to say, like address these things, but uh, I agree with you that this is a huge issue too. So that we need to take care of this so that we need to avoid such missing leakage from the orphan wells or any like uh, shale wells or whatsoever. Thank you, Professor Jin. For your yeah, thank you. Talk. Does anyone have another question? Let, let me ask you, uh, uh, Charlie, uh, thank you for the, the talk. I think it was very nice. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'm going to talk about kerogen. Uh, the, uh, if I understood, uh, he, he, you define a kerogen from some uh, model uh, from literature. And uh, and for surprise, for my surprise, this is kind of not hydrophob uh, uh, matrix. I expect some more hydrophob behavior than it is, uh, maybe. Uh, but my question is, <clears throat> uh, in your model, uh, the kerogen was, the structure of the kerogen was fixed, or it's uh, can, can, can uh, swelling or expand or compress depend on the pressure of CO2. Yeah, uh, Fred, thank you very much for your question. It's a hard question and a very nice question. I believe that you asked two questions. So talking about the model, yes, we get it from the literature that is done by Ujiner's group from the French. I think uh, they have a collaboration with the Kwasin. And uh, 
And it is also surprising to us that uh, this model shows that um, it's more or less like a weekly water wet. But actually, there are some experimental measurements shows that this caldron can absorb or dissolve water, sucking the water into. So there are certain degree of the hydrophilicity there. But um, talking about this model, actually, I talked to one of the guys who developed this model in 2019 during ACS meeting. He mentioned that current model can be accurate in terms of chemical chemistry perspective. It's not accurate in terms of mechanical perspective. For example, calogen shouldn't be soluble in polar solvents in principle. But if we use a current model, they are truly, they are, they are, they are actually like a soluble in the, in the polar solvent. So from that perspective, certainly there is a, a limit, limitation in the current model. So for that part, we need to keep doing the research, not only from the molecular simulation or the force field development, but also from the experimental measurements perspective. And we try to find some experimental measurement in terms of say the contact angle, but uh, it, it is hard to get this data because of, you know, to say separate this calogen from the shell is not an easy task. So, but talking of answering your second question, in this work, we use the fixed calogen model, but truly calogen would swell in, the, in, in CO2. And actually Abbas sent me an email a couple of days ago, mentioned that he do, they developed a new calogen swelling model, which I should read. Maybe um, we can check out these uh, swelling models, but yeah, certainly this swelling, I personally believe plays a very important role, especially in terms of diffusion. For example, if it swells, it can close, narrows down the pore throats, and then it will impede the, the diffusion process or the flow process. Thank you. Uh, I, I believe that uh, this, uh, well, mobility uh, or changing structure may be play an uh, important role some of uh, points uh, like like uh, you, I I was I, I like a, a lot the the analysis that you, you show us about uh, the region that may may dissolve or may absorb or may solve uh, water but some region do not uh, some regions do not and some region can do depending on the structure. But uh, when you inject high pressure CO2, carbon dioxide, uh, it may access both, both uh, regions and maybe it can change uh, the structure um, more than one region than the other one. So we can change the more, uh, wettability of the system. I don't know. It's, I, but yeah. it's very interesting analysis. Yeah. So Actually, for that, for the gases often induced the, the swallow, there have been some studies. One group, as far as I know, from China University of Petroleum, they have been doing this for years. And uh, there are a number of different uh, literatures we can, we can find. So if you're interested, I can certainly share these papers with you. And um, yeah, but uh, certainly this uh, mobility and the structure because of swallowing, it's a mm -hmm. very important issue, but oftentimes, they are ignored. And that is something I would say it's different from the like synthetic porous media, like a typical morph. But there are some of the morph, they can change the structures. And that can certainly affect the mobility too. So there are yeah. certainly some understanding in the material science, but the shell is a, it's a complicated issue. Sure, sure. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Jin. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your great presentation. Uh, I always follow your works. They're really nice and full of novelty. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, the methodology in a specific, uh, I'm going to talk about the force field, the common force field that we can uh, employ for modeling uh, intermolecular uh, interaction for clay is, it, is might be interface uh, or even kill it if, if uh, or it's modified. Uh, but my question is that, have you ever considered the polar polarizability of uh, force field? This, um, this uh, actually, the effect of polarizability in the, um, uh, in your simulation, because as you know, it affects the ions distribution and um, 
based on uh, my experience, it seriously affects, uh, for example, in the result of atomic uh, density profile. Yeah, thank you very much for your questions and the comments. I should say that's a great question, a great point to mention. And uh, in our current studies, uh, we just use some of the classic phosphor like a clay FF for the, uh, the clay. And we certainly haven't used the polarizable uh, phosphor, so we cannot address the polarizability effect. But I believe that this polarizable uh, polarizability should play an important role. And that is from my previous experience working on the electric double layer, sorry, the EDLC, that is a supercapacitor case. In yes, that case, yes. the polarizability actually plays a huge role. But so far in our studies yet, um, I, we haven't studied. And uh, one point I was thinking about this, I was trying to look into some of polarizable force field like um, uh, the group in University of Utah, I've all of a sudden forgot, uh, Dimitri Badarov, they developed the polarizable force field for Apple, mm -hmm. Apple MP, but that is mainly for the battery things. I was thinking that whether it can be applicable to the high pressure, high temperature conditions. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes. talking about polarizable effect, I think uh, another thing we need to consider is that we also need a very accurate experimental measurements in this aspect to, yes. uh, to validate whether the polarizability is important or not first, I think. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you for attending the seminar. Welcome here. Any other question, everyone? Okay, so we think it's time to wrap it up. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Fred. And uh, it was uh, my great honor to present our work and uh, getting a lot of nice questions. Mm -hmm.